Good morning. Welcome to the Methodist Church. We are so glad that you joined us for worship this morning. My name is Kelly, and I am here to welcome you. We are glad you are here and hope that you enjoy your experience this morning. If this is your first time visiting either online or in person, you can help us get to know you by texting the word VISIT to 559-657-6848. And be sure to fill out the digital connection card. If this is not your first time, then please text the word HERE to 559-657-6848 or just leave a comment on Facebook. And now, before we begin worshiping with the band and Alejandra, let's take just a moment to get ourselves a little centered, to put aside the hecticness of the week before us, to pause and push away the worries of tomorrow. And let's just breathe in the presence of God, knowing that his Holy Spirit is right here with us right now. Let him fill your heart, your mind, and your soul. Let's stand and praise God together. Good morning, everybody. How are you all doing today? Praise be to God. Well, it says in James 1, 2 through 4, Dear brothers and sisters, when any troubles when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. And in Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Amen. So today, let's declare this morning that God is good, amen, and that his mercy endureth forever, amen? Let's do this.
good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. One more time. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and Very nice. Thank you. Please be seated. We will be looking in the New Testament at the Gospel of Mark, the fourth chapter, verses 21 through 25. If you have your Bibles with you, or if you have Scripture on your phone, Mark 4, 21 through 25, or you can look it up when you get home and rewatch the sermon, because maybe you'll want to. I hope you had a, a good week. The Creels uh, gained a family member yesterday, a small dog, a Tibetan terrier, which I think m might mean uh, uh, American uh, mutt. <laughs> Beautiful dog, and he's happy to see me so far every time I come into the room. Uh, hard to underestimate how important that is. Okay, are you ready? Yeah, you're going to want to know, you, I'll need the feedback because of the big uh, clock that I watch back there, I don't know what time it's telling, but it's an alternate time, so I could be here for an hour uh, un unless I'm satisfied that you have leaned into this thing and gotten it. All right, let's start this way. So I, I had the privilege of going to our Grief Share program last week. They call me in for uh, two sessions of Grief Share to talk about stuff that's kind of esoteric and very uh, hard uh, to describe. In Grief Share over the years, Bill Rocco, who uh, leads grief share for our church ha has really gotten his uh, mind wrapped around some of the questions. This week's question was uh, why, right, uh, uh, or uh, effectively why not in many instances also, right? Why did my loved one pass away or why didn't our prayers come to fruition? Why didn't God do what we wanted God to do? And when we're talking ab about those kinds of uh, pretty heavy stuff, Bill does a really great job uh, of taking his background, which is science, and combining it with theology to help people understand God in a, a new way. So I, I'm going to give you the amateur version of, of what Bill uh, uh, does. And, and where is Bill seated? All right. So do not look at Bill because he may be going, no, that's close. No, no, no. So one of the things that, that happen in Grief Share and in all of our lives is, is we struggle with the concept of why it is that uh, bad things happen or why it is that, that things don't go the way that we want them to go when we are following uh, God at least as best as we know how. And, and the answer in a general sense is it's because God is truly and genuinely other, right? We tend to think of God only in terms of um, a very powerful other person. But God is other. God is beyond anything that, 
that we can actually know through our experience. And that puts God in a really different perspective. So the way Bill describes it is this. Even time itself, the way that we mark time, the time of our lives, time of each day, the forward progress of time, is not true for God. God is not bound by time. And the way we think about that is that uh, from a scientific point of view, time as we understand it and live it began at what's called the Big Bang. Prior to the Big Bang, nothing existed at all, not, not even matter. And then in the Big Bang, matter and, and eventually everything that does exist started. And, and if you think of it as having an outward trajectory from the, from the point of origin, that outward trajectory is what we call time, right? So we are, our universe is expanding and moving through space and, and creating time as it goes. So here's the easy way to understand uh, the concept of, of an eternal God. We believe that God created the Big Bang, right? That, that he willed it into existence. That was his method of creating eventually uh, all the things that we know. And that means that God existed to uh, create those things before time was. And God continually exists outside of time. So as hard as it is for us to imagine... God has never been bound by the vagaries and, and, if you will, the prison of time that we exist in. God is eternal. A and when we consider the question, why doesn't God do what I ask God to do, right? I, I do the right things, I, I go to church, I pray, uh, etc. So why doesn't God answer when I, when I pray, right? Why is it so rare for a true miracle to happen? Well, the big answer is because God exists outside of time, God is not trapped I into uh, our understanding of, I, I don't think I can take this anymore, right? I, I don't know what will happen to me if, if this thing happens. God has an eternal concept, <clears throat> and he is vying not for our comfort at all times here. He is vying when he enters the realm of time to so impact us that we are prepared to be released from time when we begin to live our eternal lives. So it's very hard to understand from our perspective, the reasons God might give for not answering prayers or for allowing people to die or the, the world being as unfair as it is. But we have this hope that the God who exists outside of time, who, who knows both what we would call past, present, and, and future, is always and everywhere acting in our individual lives in such a way that we're presented with the opportunity to break through and to communion, right, to, to, to uh, enter into our eternal selves. We believe at death that the soul is released from time, but we also believe that as we go through life in the flesh, we are being prepared, if we will, for that eventuality. That clears it up, yes? That anybody need to call somebody in your family and say, Pastor Steve just saw... Uh, yeah. We are blessed in the modern world to at least understand scientifically that there was a beginning, right, a, a, a Big Bang. And, and so conceptually, we can kind of flesh those kind of things out. Imagine how difficult it was for Jesus, who was God, making the decision to be captured by time, right, to be enfleshed is what we say, right, uh, and, and to be limited in the severe way that time and uh, uh, our, our existence would limit a limitless being. Uh, imagine being Jesus a, and trying to explain any of that or even the concepts of that to people who had really good engineering science, but not much else, right? You couldn't explain it the way I, I just did because th they would have no idea what anybody was, was talking about. S so the task that Jesus had when he taught was at least twofold, and we forget this all the time because of people like me, because of preachers, right? We're always self-serving in the way that, that we look at, at Scripture. So Jesus taught many parables, and in the church, you usually hear those parables interpreted as, this is what you're supposed to do. So, so Jesus taught a sower went out to sow, and as he went, he sowed many seeds, yes? And, and the church interprets that as, uh, the church is supposed to be the sower. You're supposed to be inviting people to church. You're supposed to be witnessing wherever you go. Say amen if you've heard that sermon. Only Don preached it. Yeah. <laughs> 
well, good, then, then I've got the preaching schedule lined out for, for next year. We'll, we'll go over some of these parables in, in, in that way. So we are, we are usually guilty of interpreting everything Jesus said as if it uh, pertains to what we're supposed to do. And it does on a certain level. But its primary purpose really was for Jesus to try to describe to the apostles, to his closest followers, what in the world was happening. Because if you want to ask the question why, there's no finer group than the 11 who finally made it to the resurrection, right? Why would this man who can heal anybody not heal himself? Why this one who is so powerful and so good and, and has created such excitement in our nation, a hope for freedom, why would he allow himself to be captured and, and uh, tried and, and shamed in public and then put to, to death? They had a ton of why questions. And they would need to have a concept of God that was greater than the concept they had before they met Jesus. So Jesus' task was to find a way to talk to these people 2,000 years ago and to give them a way to reflect and understand what was happening, for lack of a better word, on the cosmic level with the entrance of Christ into humanity. And the parables are the way that he did that. So I'm going to read the, the parable now, and you, most of you will have heard it or heard of it at some point. As I read it, allow yourself the privilege for once in church of not feeling guilty because you, you don't do anything about this parable, and, and allow yourself the privilege of being able to hear Jesus trying to explain to his followers who and what he actually was, because that's how I want to look at it today. So he has just performed a ton of miracles pretty much in the early parts of mark anybody who comes anywhere near him that needs healed he heals we think that in light of that there were some happy ideas floating around and those happy ideas would have been how's about we set up a house of healing we could sell uh, healing badges and, and trinkets and, and little plastic goodies in, in the uh, entrance and then they could come through and Jesus could, could heal like one at a time or we could just have them all line up outside, pay their $10 and Jesus could cast a big healing on everybody. We get, wow, that would be amazing. So they saw his power to heal, to change the physical problems and, and really likely they centered in on that because they were exactly like we are, right? If healing started popping up every time we got together, real bona fide medically provable healings, we would have a big idea that this should be a church that specialized in healing. You know that's true, right? Here is his reply to that happy idea. Here is his gentle pushback and explanation to their wanting to limit him to a very time-bound thing, which is to heal us now, even though if you heal us now, we know we'll be broken later anyway. He says, he said to them, do you bring a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put the lamp on the stand? Whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. So if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Can you hear that in a different way, your own self, as we read it in that context? Jesus continues, consider carefully what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more, and whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Those are really esoteric sayings, right? I can't imagine that they understood any of it when they first heard it. But again, the parables are beautiful because they're easy to memorize and to reflect on as you go. So I thought for fun and amusement, my fun, uh, your amusement, I, I would list the, the things that the presence of Jesus revealed about the truth of our world. Sometimes I'm alone in, at my little desk typing the sermons and imagining that people will lean in and, and get ready to write down, but I know it's all recorded and, and you'll go back later. So here's a list of, of things that were revealed, in fact, by the light of Jesus' life, his death and his resurrection. They were revealed to anyone who, who was actually willing to pay attention. And happily, uh, what was revealed still is true and we can learn from it. Number one, first thing, wow, the big lie, the absolute breaking of the first 
commandment, which is have no other gods before me, it was revealed in and through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection that most people never progress in their faith past that because they believe that the church and or the government authority, and in, their, in the time of Jesus, they were the same. The Sanhedrin is the seat of government for Israel. They believe that those who are, have power, right, are vying for the things that they want and have the power to deliver them. In Jesus' time, the average Jewish person living in Israel fervently believed that the government officials were working hard to figure out how to cast off the yoke of Rome and free them. The life and death and resurrection of Jesus in its intrigue shows clearly to anyone wanting to pay attention, anyone willing to take that step, that if they believed that their government was working for God's purposes in their lives in the way that they wanted, they had been worshiping a false god. The government absolutely was not. You'll remember the story is that once the Jewish officials got angry at Jesus, they went and talked to the Romans, and they went and talked to the Romans without fear because they were in league with the Romans. The people with power were granted that power by Rome, and they had no problem with continuing the system of deprivation for their citizens for as long as they lived because it empowered them. You should by now be thinking of the modern world. So the first thing that is revealed by Jesus is how often human beings put their trust in that which is not trustworthy. That would be government. That would be leadership uh, um, in the political realm of any kind because leadership has power and they're going to act in such a way that they keep power, not distribute it to anyone else. So the combination of, of Roman justice and, and the Sanhedrin's manipulations and, and fear of Jesus worked perfectly to continue the status quo and Israel would stay stuck effectively under Roman yoke until Rome wiped them off the face of the map about 70 years later. Interesting, isn't it? I'll let you apply in detail that concept. You need only see the fervency and the willingness to leave behind grace or kindness or gentleness or wise judgment that is exhibited in all of our politics in the modern age to understand that great mistake is being made again over and over and over by people of faith. Our faith rests in God, God who is outside of the bounds and the vagaries of time. And we do best when we make sure we're serving that God, not a human institution. Number two, closer to home for the average person, God does, in fact, have the power to heal. He can heal far away from where he is with, with a word or a desire. He can heal with a touch. He healed in all kinds of different ways for all kinds of different reasons. But God does, in fact, have the power to intervene in the flow of history and change what has occurred naturally when he desires. But he doesn't desire to heal most people of those things. That's clear mathematically. Even in churches where they try to produce a healing week after week after week, praying in tongues and laying on hands and hoping to, to show that they're miracle makers, the statistics are, wow, if you know somebody who was verifiably healed in a way that science can't explain, right, who was made better in an instant like that, they're a miracle, meaning one in a hundred million. Because God, who has the power to change the things that cause us discomfort or, or fear or really seem to harm us has a higher interest for us. It was revealed in Jesus' decision to allow his flesh and blood to be captured, to be tortured, to be broken, and to be killed. He could have, as he himself said, called down legions of angels and changed the dynamic. And in our lives, when we pray fervently for someone we love who is hurt or is enduring difficulties, 
we wonder, if the truth be told, why doesn't God just do this thing that is so obviously right? It is because God is not in pursuit of alleviation of our current pain. He is in pursuit of saving our souls from eternal pain. They are very different. They're different in this way. I'll testify from my own life. The worst things that have happened to me that I prayed most fervently and recruited the most people to pray with me about are the very things that drove me to a point where I finally learned in some measure to quit worshiping the things of this world and to quit worshiping the absence of difficulty in my life. Another way to say that. I was driven to the point of actually worshiping God as God is and more for the reasons God has by pain that was not alleviated through prayer. Jesus said, look, I know it would be great to have a house of healing and everybody would know who we were and it would be wonderful. But I am the light sent from God into the darkness of humanity. And I didn't come for what's wrong with you now. I came to shed light on eternity and how to access it. God heals in many ways. He does not, in fact, heal very often in the ways that we desire. And if we're willing to pay attention to that, here is what we may learn that we need to change the things that we desire to be more in line with what God wills for us. The apostles, who also had the power of healing, healed many other people in the beginning of their ministries, but they too succumbed in their own way to a variety of physical and political ailments until every one of them died in like manner as Jesus. But... Their witness is that as they gave in to the degradation of time, they felt their spirits freed from time, and they became more and more eternal even as they lived here. So if you've prayed to God and said, why, why won't you do this? The suggestion from the life of Jesus is that God would lovingly reply, Please listen more closely to what I have promised. Third thing, oftentimes those who are believed to be closest to God are guilty of trying to use that reputation to leverage the natural power that God has and either get God to do what they want God to do or to get people to think that they can get God to do what people want God to do. I know that's complex. Let me give you a single word to memorize that by, or two words, I guess. Modern church. The biggest, most successful, most powerful ministries in the West very frequently have this in common. People believe that there is something about the pastor or about some aspect of the church that gives them entree to the power to leverage God so that God will give them what they want. Sometimes healing, sometimes success in business, sometimes even more frivolous things. And they flock to those churches because those churches tell them in order, you're a winner if you attend our church, give us money and believe what we tell you to do. And if you're a winner, God will give you more of what you already desire. Can you spot the missing part of that equation? The very idea of being a disciple of Jesus Christ is to learn to radically change your desires so you're no longer seeking what you were when you were supposed to be lost. Jesus showed clearly in the way that he dealt with people and in what he left behind what he was about. He is not recorded as having had the effect on anyone that they gained wealth because of their association with him. He is not recorded, and believe me, he would have been in the New Testament as having leveraged his power from eternity so that the apostles became 
more or less worshipped by everyone around them because they could get God to do what people wanted God to do. It's not fair. But if you pay attention to big-time evangelical ministry in the United States and throughout the West, you will hear a message that I just told you. The message is, we got the power, baby, and if you do what we tell you to do and you make us happy, God will give you that power. And furthermore, if God doesn't give you that power, it's not our fault, it's your fault, because you're not faithful enough or you're not giving enough. If you don't believe me, check out any megachurch you want. Jesus revealed that the things of man, even when they seem absolutely right, who doesn't want God to bless you so you can have more of what you want? The things of man, even when they seem right, can be not only wrong, but they can be walls that separate human beings who buy into it from the possibility of having an actual relationship with the living God. It will go on until time is over. If you've read the book of Revelation, you see what becomes of those things. So I thought by now we'd be like standing and shouting amen and preach it, brother, and stuff. I'm just going to plow through the rest of it. Remember, we were friends before I wrote this, and next week I'll try harder. Number four, the genuine power of God to bring people peace, joy, and purpose is accessible, but not through the means that most people employ here is how you actually gain peace that is not upset by having a bad day. Peace that is so powerful that even when your heart's desire, the safety of another person is not granted, you're able to maintain a peace. Here's how you gain joy that is inexplicable because it's not based on your most recent victory. It's based on your being alive in God's presence. You do it through humility. You do it through accepting. God has created time and placed us in it, and time is going to do its work no matter how hard I pray. I might get healed today, maybe, for a purpose that I can't understand, but in time, this flesh of mine and all my friends and all those I love, it's going to pass because that's the nature of things. And if you gain humility enough to say, okay, that's how it is, therefore, what should I be doing while I'm in the stream of time? immediately becomes crystal clear. Quit wasting your time trying to gather a bunch of stuff that dies with you. The one who dies and leaves the largest estate has not won. They just haven't. They have devoted their life in the stream of time to something that is vapid and temporary. If you want the things that God has promised all followers, joy and peace it's found through the humility to accept that is in fact the equation and when you accept that on a deep level which you do when your prayers aren't answered and you have to accept human beings are made of flesh and flesh is a vague thing the only logical conclusion you don't have to be a person religious to come to this conclusion is wow with what time i have left i'd really like to be spending my time in a quality way with the people in my life He revealed that. That's what Jesus not only said, it, it's how he lived. He's, he spent the entirety of his life surrounded by close associates who he was mentoring and, and uh, relating to and encouraging them to do the same because that is, in fact, the will of God who created time, that in the time we have in the flesh, we might learn the most valuable lessons, which are through relationships how to love somebody who's imperfect, how to ask for forgiveness, how to grant forgiveness, and how to really care more about other people's welfare than our own. Last one on the list. Because the powers of this world are impotent in their struggle against God, they cannot produce for any people an eternal victory. Only God can do that. And because what God was trying to give to humanity through Jesus is not associated with power or with wealth or with intelligence or any of the other things that we value so highly, 
It is the one thing that we know of in all of existence that is radically and truly equal. In the Central Valley of California, you can own your own business and be very successful and be surrounded by friends uh, of like uh, power and wealth and have a very happy life and have a relationship with Jesus Christ that is genuine and which is the true center of your joy. Absolutely. I know people who fit that description. I have no doubt they have the joy of Christ in spite of their trappings. And you can be a field worker with questionable paperwork, no one knowing where you came from, no one wanting to see you in real life because you just need to be invisible, huddling up in 105 degree heat in what amounts to little more than a lean-to shack, and have that exact same joy that other people enjoy in different circumstances. The things of God, the gifts of Christ, they are radically equal. My hunch is a part of the reason the church in the West has gone so crazy and chased so many false gods and become, in its own way, just so corrupt and broken on a broad level is because many people know about the radical equality of the gifts of God and they hate that because all they want in their life is to prove they're better than other people, whether that's by skin color or income or address or anything else. And so they learn to despise the very God who gifted them the things that they most need, and they work against anything that would show that equality. I could be wrong about any one of these things, or all of them. They're based on my experience, on my knowledge of Scripture, on thinking about these things over and over. So, Jesus said, no, brother, I cannot be a healing machine. That's not why I came, right? I know it's nice, and we're going to do some more of it. Less and less as he went along, right? But you don't come from eternity and limit yourself in this horrific way to the flesh and all the things that go with it just to temporarily relieve some pain that's not the main purpose i came you should watch carefully pay attention and i'll show you why i came and the proof of why he came is located in the cross first to remind us, as much as we pray incessantly for the things we want and believe that we need and seem right to us, that was never the intent of the Messiah. The intent of the Messiah was to help us in humility face the fact that we're time-bound. And as we exist today, at some point, we'll no longer exist that way. It has to be faced. It just does, no matter how badly we despise that truth. And then, for those with eyes to see and ears to hear, not far from that cross is an empty tomb. That is the promise of God through the ages that those who pay attention to what Jesus was and what he did, who take the leap of faith to believe that in God's eyes we are equal to anyone else with belief, to those who trod that path, there is, in fact, an escape hatch from time into eternity. And only the one who exists in eternity knows the way, and he has shown us the way. So let me tell you as... Well, let's see what the big clock says. Oh, i got another hour. That's great. <laughs> let me tell you as closely as I can what our church is trying to do about that. We try to create ministries in which these foundational truths have a chance to take seed and to grow. For instance, in a room in the middle of the week, in a lazy afternoon with six people in it, our church endeavors to use its resources and time and energy and prayer life to set it up so that someone 
who is still reeling from the death of their spouse, the love of their life, might not just find solace amongst other people who have suffered the same, but in that solace, the seed that will free them from unrelenting pain can be planted. It's kingdom stuff in grief share. I promise you it is. We exist also in, in our main function as a church be, beyond Sunday morning worship in grace groups. And grace groups week after week after week are a rehearsal by everybody who goes to grace group of how did I live into what I know Christ taught this week and where did I fail to live into what Christ taught this week and please, please tell me again what did Christ teach? It's an incessant refining process that gives everybody who's a part of it who will give themselves to it more and more the opportunity to begin to understand how to access the miracle that God has provided and will continue to provide for everyone that miracle being a sense that you belong in the kingdom of God and that in that kingdom you might have peace divorce care grief share Grace groups, mending the soul, ladies' Bible study, men's Bible study, every group we have devoted to this singular cause to give people an opportunity to see the truth, to embrace the truth, and to be freed from the truth. If you come to the Methodist Church and I say, I cannot promise you that you're going to be successful in whatever it is that your heart desires. Not a bad thing to desire, but I don't, I don't know. God cares if you... Uh, get your wildest dreams or not. I can tell you, he's never granted mine. Minnesota Vikings, 0-4 in the Super Bowl, pathetic this year. I am disgusted again. Also, I never got to pitch in the World Series except in my mind's eye as I fell off to sleep. And those have been lifelong prayers of mine. Also, he didn't heal Karen. In those things, I have found God and peace. And my desire is to pass what has been discovered on to as many people as I can, whether or not it's the most popular game in town. I don't care. I only care that we seek the truth with a fervor and a passion born of faith. Amen. your goodness, God. And Holy Spirit, remind us of the gifts that you have blessed us with, Lord. And when we feel in our lowest moments, God, that you remind us of your goodness, that you remind us of your peace, Lord. fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God
are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have been keep our eyes fixed on you in this moment, Lord, that everything else just washes away, God, and we just focus on your beauty, focus on your glory, Lord, because you are our Father, our mighty Savior. God, you are our everything, our rock, our shield, our banner of, of dignity and hope, God. You are our healer, God, and so we trust in you in this day, God. And as we leave the church today, Lord, that we continue to meditate on your word, meditate on your truth, God, because you are our everything, and that you receive all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise in our lives, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Can you bow now for a few moments? <laughs>
Will you bow your heads for a word of prayer? Father, we are grateful to you for shining your light through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now those gathered here in this assembly who are willing to take a step forward into that light, know that in the coming week, God will bless you as you endeavor to seek humility and grace and peace. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.